Soon you'll see things our way. We've been waiting for you, Coraline. I didn't hear anything. Oh, I definitely heard someone. Why were you born? You said something dumb again. Fine, fine. Since everyone won't stop asking, I've decided to give you all what you want and do a horror history episode on Wyborn Lovat from Coraline. And the truth is, Wybie was only created for the movie. He's not in the book at all, so he technically has no history. So remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell! Now obviously I'll have to go off of the movie and the movie alone for this episode, but if you want to hear what goes on with YB while he's off screen, then stick around to the end of this video. Part of what makes the world of Coraline special is that the artistic choices made reflect the themes of the story. The book tells the tale of a girl who finds this fake world and is intrigued by the small differences that it has to her world. I like to think of the film as a whole as its own world to be treated differently than the book. And the most noticeable difference, the snow globe of the film, if you will, is the inclusion of YB. Welcome to Horror History, my name is Why Was I Born, and in today's lesson we'll be covering the character who probably owns the most Jack Skellington merch, Wyborn Lovat. Of course, there is a much more practical reason for YB's inclusion, as explained by the director Henry Selick in an interview with Cinema Blend. When I decided to add the character of YB, I realized that Coraline needed somebody in her real world to talk to. Another kid seemed like the most simple way to go. But the character that ended up on screen was much more than a glorified exposition prompter. So in order to understand YB's importance to the lore and history of this dark twisted world, let's take it back to the beginning of his story. YB looks to be about Coraline's age and lives with his grandma in a property not far from the Pink Palace apartments where Coraline lives. It is not known what happened to his parents, but we do know the fate of his great aunt. She once lived with YB's grandmother in the Pink Palace before it was converted into separate apartments. As discussed in the horror history episode on The Other Mother, living at the Pink Palace made her a target for the Beldum. In the movie, the Beldum spies on her potential victims through the eyes of this doll, which is placed in the real world for the children to find. 
Wybie's great aunt became attached to the doll, and one day she disappeared and became trapped in the Beldum's world. I think Wybie's grandmother suspected some foul play, because she moved out of the palace when she was old enough, and when it became hers, she renovated it into apartments, and didn't allow families with children to move there until the events of Coraline. We don't know why Coraline is an exception to this rule, but there is one line to suggest that she simply had to rent the place to the Joneses because of anti-age discrimination laws. Surprised she let you move in. My grandma, she owns the Pink Palace. You won't rent to people with kids. What do you mean? Oh, I'm not supposed to talk about it. On a side note, Wybie's grandma is referred to as grandma throughout most of the movie and Wybie's grandmother in the credits. At one point, Coraline refers to her as Ms. Lovat. Welcome, Ms. Lovat. The woman doesn't correct Coraline, so by that logic, it was her son that was Wybie's father, passing down the last name Lovat all the way to him. The fact that she is Ms. Lovat rather than Mrs. Lovat also suggests that she gave birth to Wybie's dad out of wedlock, meaning that Wybie's grandfather hasn't been part of the picture for some time now. It's also possible that Coraline just didn't know whether to call her Ms. or Mrs. I thought we got past that. But this guy wants to bring it back. After the disappearance of her sister, she locked the doll away in a chest until it was reclaimed by the Beldum and turned into a Coraline doll, where it was then put back in the chest for Wybie to find. Other than exploring the area around his house on his electric bicycle, Wybie seems to be passionate about photography. He makes friends with the wild cat, which he sometimes feeds in exchange for the dead things that the cat brings him at night. He first encounters Coraline after she moves in when he hears the scream after the cat had startled her. He approaches and mistakes her for a water witch, and rides in to take the stick that he perceives to be her dowsing rod. When they meet, we see that despite his intimidating appearance, he's actually pretty shy, oftentimes stuttering and avoiding eye contact. His hunched over posture does not exude confidence, which coupled with the information that kids are never usually moved into the Pink Palace, we can conclude that he doesn't have any friends, other than the cat that is. Coraline has the same issue at the beginning of her story. She's constantly bored and none of the adults around her have time to play with her. Despite this, Coraline and Wybie don't really get along when they first meet. Wybie does tell her about the location of the well though, before his grandmother calls him in, ringing a bell for him as she does so. Grandma. Wybie seems embarrassed by his grandmother's strict control over his whereabouts. I believe this may be because after all of these years, she's still scarred by losing her sister, and fears the same could happen to her grandson if he gets too close to the Pink Palace. As a result, Wybie has never been inside of the building. Grandma, kill me. So he goes home and finds the doll, which he recognizes to be identical to Coraline, and leaves it on her porch with a note. The next morning, he's snooping around and spies on her using some kind of periscope helmet. When she catches him, he claims to be hunting banana slugs. Director Henry Selleck may have gone with banana slugs as the creature of choice to set up what happens to the other YB later in the story. Coraline claims to be annoyed by YB because of his loud mouth, causing the other mother to create a mute version of him in the other world. Banana slugs have a defense mechanism, where the mucus that they release contains chemicals that are capable of numbing the tongue of their predators. Despite Coraline claiming not to like YB, she does still seem to enjoy taking the photos of him in various poses with the banana slug. Outside of one other encounter with Coraline where YB claims that Mr. Bobinski's jumping mouse circus is a lie, the two would not encounter each other until the next day. But Coraline does meet his doppelganger, the other YB. As we established when I covered the history of the other mother, the button-eyed doppelganger forms of each character found in the other world aren't really connected to their real-world counterparts. However, the duplicate versions can still teach us about the nature of the originals, because the other mother's intention was to create more enticing forms of the people in Coraline's life. As with the other father, the other YB seems to have a mind of his own and only acts the way he does out of fear for the Beldum. In addition to being friendly and incapable of speech, he's also less shy, stands up straight, and wears more conventional clothing. He seems to be the more ideal version of YB to be friends with Coraline, but like the endless amounts of delicious food and the freedom offered by the Beldum's world, other YB ends up being another example of things being better off as they were initially. Coraline maybe doesn't realize how lonely she is, and maybe having a friend who doesn't talk isn't doing her any favors in that regard. One of the first things that Coraline asks him is if the treatment used to make him silent caused him any pain, and he immediately changes the subject, probably knowing that he's under constant scrutiny by the other mother. The two go to see the Jumping Mouse Circus, the very same Jumping Mouse Circus that the real YB called BS on. After seeing Coraline off to bed before she exits from the other world that night, the other YB shows that he really does have good intentions by warning the cat about the true nature of the other world. Coraline returns to her world, and while YB is nowhere to be seen the next day when Mr. and Mrs. Jones take their daughter into town to buy a uniform, there are other kids in that scene, which tells us two things. First, Coraline shows no interest in meeting them despite her loneliness, because of their erratic behavior, which could be a clue that the often awkward and reserved YB could actually be a more compatible friendship for her. She may have 
gotten the wrong idea about him from their initial meeting. And second, there are other kids nearby, so the fact that we never see YB play with or talk about any other kids could mean that he has no friends. And maybe I'm assuming too much by saying this, but it's easy to imagine him being bullied for his outlandish fashion choices and unconventional hobbies. The other YB, on the other hand, pun intended, is copied from the original YB, but changed in ways that the Beldum thought to be improvements. Both versions seem to like Coraline and want to help her. In the case of the other YB, the Beldum may have made him friendly and likable because her goal was to try to make Coraline want to stay. She probably didn't realize that the other YB's good intentions would be used against her. I could see her thinking that making him mute would stop him from helping Coraline in any way, but that ends up not being the case. The other YB is forced to accompany her to the theater, where he has a very weird reaction to seeing the nearly naked Miss Forcible. <laughs> He keeps up the cheery attitude until he's no longer needed. As Coraline goes inside, the other mother gives him a harsh reminder that he needs to keep on a smile the whole time, despite the fact that he's clearly unhappy. While Coraline is locked away in the mirror realm, the other mother punishes the other YB for his insubordination. She uses her seamstress abilities to tie his mouth into a permanent smile, ensuring that he'll never give any negative energy towards Coraline. It's basically like when you go to a fast food restaurant and the person at the counter is smiling because they don't want to get fired, but deep down they're probably like, someone get me out of here. <laughs> at this point, I think that other YB has been pushed to a breaking point. He's been brought into this world by the other mother and forced to do her bidding. He may not have had any hope for himself, but thought that he could at least do the brave thing and make sure that Coraline doesn't share the same fate. Ironically, he wears a chicken mask to cover up his forced smile when he reaches into the mirror to rescue her, and she removed the cover-up to find that the other YB was no chicken at all. He manages to sneak her back to the gateway between the two worlds, but when she tries to invite him to come along, his hand erodes into the stuffing used to make the doll that was used to spy on each target. I think this was his way of telling her that he has no way to survive out there in the real world. He was just a tool created by the Beldum, no different than the doll that Coraline would discard in the fire. We never see the other YB again after that, but we can assume that he, no longer being useful to the other mother, was discarded as well. The other mother hangs his clothes on the flagpole atop her world as a warning to all of her other creations about what will happen if they disobey her. Meanwhile, the original YB is still fine and well, but he gets himself into a different kind of trouble. His grandmother is upset with him for stealing the doll that once belonged to her sister. YB tries to go back to Coraline's flat to ask for it, explaining that it wasn't his to give. And this causes Coraline to realize that Ms. Lovat's sister and the ghost girl she had encountered are one and the same. She brings YB inside, his first time setting foot in the Pink Palace, and tries to explain everything that she knew about the other world. Which, of course, sounds crazy. Crazy! <laughs> And she gets upset and chases him out, but when he returned home, he would find something that changed his views on Coraline's story. His grandmother showed him a picture from her childhood. The photograph shows Ms. Lovat and her sister, who is holding the doll, which YB recognizes from Coraline's story. He rushes out to try to find her and apologize for not believing her, and finds her headed back to the old well. Before he gets the chance to say anything, she is attacked by the rogue hand of the Beldum. Using the same tongs that he uses to catch the banana slugs, he rides in and saves her, but nearly throws himself into the well in doing so. Coraline saves him from falling in, but exposes herself to an attack. That is when YB puts an end to it, by crushing the hand with a rock, rescuing Coraline, and finally avenging the great aunt that he never met in doing so. Together, they throw the hand down the well, and as far as we know, the Beldum is never heard from again. YB apologizes for not believing Coraline sooner, but she isn't upset, and asks him to bring his grandma by the house so that they can explain everything together. I took this ending as not only the ending to the Beldum's reign, with the cat being seen taking advantage of the freedom to now travel between worlds as he pleases, but also the ending of Ms. Lovat's paranoia about the curse of the Pink Palace, and the children who inhabit it. She would finally be able to rest easy, knowing that her sister's ghost was not in agony. And finally, it marks the ending of loneliness for both Coraline and Wybie, who now each had a new friend their age. Click the playlist on the left for my full list. And I want to apologize to all of you for what I did. It was very wrong, and I am very sorry. I just would like to move on and lead a normal life. You know, get a job and a wife and change my ways. And I hope this apology impresses you, even though my grandmother made me do it, and I don't really mean it. You mean you do mean it. I mean I do mean it.